So let's flash back to Melbourne, Park Fermi after the race. You're both in the first three again. What does it feel like when you get out of the car and you embrace one another and you both know you're going to be on the podium? Ralph, what's that like? Well, it's, it's always a nice feeling, especially when you know that both family members were in a good position and uh, able to fulfill their targets for the weekend. Michael? I was very much surprised when the left after finish line, I saw this guy coming next to me and uh, uh, showing me third position. And obviously I, I, I was informed a little bit, but not totally whether he made it to the end or not. I think uh, he thought three times left. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was quite happy for, for this. It was a perfect combination because they didn't expect to be third. Uh, uh, it was a good result for them. We won our race, which was a very good result for us. So all in all, it was a ha happy family atmosphere. And it really adds to the feeling of if you've won a race, if Ralph's done very well, it really adds to that oh, feeling. Yeah, it, of gives, it gives an extra pleasure, certainly. Going back to the early days, Ralph, obviously there's a bit of an age difference between the two. Was Michael very helpful to you when you first started? Be careful what you say. <laughs> Well, actually, every time I had a question, he was able to help me with, with his experience. But at the end of the day, you sit there in the car and have to do the thing by yourself. To, to, I mean, the thing he was able to do, he always helped me, but it's, it's a bit difficult, really. Do you think you would have raced if Michael hadn't been racing? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't asked myself that question. I'm racing. It's difficult That's, to ask this question, honestly, I would yeah. say. Is he, is he a good learner? I'd say a, uh, a difficult one because I mean we, we spend a lot of time together in, in karting and I used to be his mechanic and uh, I used to be quite often upset when he wasn't there helping me to clean the go-kart and uh, running around with his friends and, and things like this but uh, he has developed and obviously uh, matured a lot uh, but talking about learning I mean you see the results so uh, you must say he did learn very well. Moving on to America now, you've both spent some time in America recently. I think you were in Utah and you, went, you were in Florida learning to yep. fly. Do you enjoy America? It's a great country for us. I mean, we are obviously not known as much as we are in Europe, so we have quite a bit of uh, freedom. We can do things, or America has a lot of options uh, where you can entertain yourself, so it's a very good country. Talking about that freedom question, do you ever wish that you were not as well known as you are, is that ever a hindrance for you in life? It's, uh, I mean, I came here for two days to, to go to Rio and uh, I had uh, the paparazzis and cameras following me uh, everywhere. I mean, it was really, uh, uh, they were chasing me. You couldn't, you couldn't move without them and that was quite a pain. And Ralph, you chose Florida to learn to fly. Why did you actually choose America? Well, basically, it's, you know, you have a stable weather condition at that time of the year, and if you want to make your PPL in the short and shortest amount of time possible, you have to go to America. That was the reason why I went there. Are there any parts of America that you've not been to that you'd like to go to? Plenty. <laughs> yeah. America's big. So Nearly 90%, I'd say. Hey, you had a good time. You, you played cowboy for a while. Is that something you've always wanted to do? I made an adventure trip, I mean the usual Marlboro adventure trip uh, uh, we did with some friends and that was a, a thing I, I wanted to do for a long time and we enjoyed very much. We had a very good organization down there which uh, uh, really uh, gave us a huge pleasure and uh, we're looking forward to, to organize uh, more of these kind of things down there. How do you imagine this American Grand Prix at Indianapolis is going to be? Have you pictured it in your mind yet, all those people, that history at Indianapolis? Mm. Ralph? Well, I'm not pretty much aware of any history, so to be honest, I go there totally open-minded. I just hope that we have a nice atmosphere, a lot of spectators, and I hope that we you know, bring Formula One back into that country to, uh, into an acceptable stage. And I think that the Americans get the chance again to try and understand what Formula One is. And where's Europe? And where's Europe? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it works both ways. <laughs> but there is a lot of history. There. You say you're not aware of history. Is that from childhood, even in normal history, it's, you only think of the future and the present? Is that the way you live your life? Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a person, I'm not very much interested in history. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but that's the way I am. And I never took care for any history. I know Formula One since Michael just driving Formula One. It is since 1990, not before. So.
you, would you say you're the same or? Yeah, no, we are both the same because our, it depends on, on the parents, how they educate yourself and our parents weren't interesting in, in motor racing. I mean, it was not our father's idea to make uh, to, to racing drivers out of us and it just developed. And if you not live this life for a long time, you, you obviously don't look at it. You have your own interest. I mean, we played football. We we did all normal things you do as a child, but we didn't care about Formula One at the stage because even in Germany, it wasn't a big deal Formula One at the time. So if I said to you, which American race driver do you most respect or admire, what would you say? Hmm. I mean, obviously we know uh, through uh, Indy, we know a couple of uh, guys which race down there. But if you would ask me about NASCAR, I couldn't tell you any names, honestly. There's two brothers in NASCAR racing, actually, Terry and Bobby Labonte. It's about the only other two brothers that race successfully at a reasonably high level in motorsport. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about outside motor racing? If I said, what American sports star do you most admire? Michael Jordan, I yeah, would say. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I would say the same, actually. I mean, basketball is a big thing in, in America. Football comes along now. Uh, when you say football, do you mean soccer, or do you mean...? I mean soccer, so, uh, right. so yeah, soccer is coming along. We say football in the, in the direct translation, but football is a big thing in America, too, but uh, I, I don't know anything about that. If you would, neither of you were racing drivers, what other profession do you think you could have successfully handled? Both. If you wouldn't be a commentator, what would you do? <laughs> you know it? Well, I don't I'm know. Not, yeah, I'm not asking the question. You've never thought of that? It's not something that... Because I, I mean, I started motor racing with... Well, I started cutting two and a half, three years, I think. It was about the f my first time that I was sitting in a car. Cut, and since then, I didn't do anything else. So, I haven't thought about anything else. Well, let's just talk about that. Two guys from the, the middle of Germany, shall we say, somewhere in Germany, who have become, obviously, a dynasty now in Formula One and Formula One is a huge worldwide sport. When you go back home, do you ever think, how did this happen? Isn't it amazing that these, that it is like this? Mm. Mm. We don't go off and home, honestly, <laughs> <laughs> first of all, because uh, we live our life out of, uh, out of Germany. But, I mean, if sometimes we may talk with our parents about this or we talk with friends about this, but if you don't do that, you don't think that way, honestly. I mean, we, when you back, go back home, you don't feel like you are Michael Schumacher, what people think, who is Michael mm. Schumacher. You simply, you yourself, you go home and you behave normal. I mean, I have my family and uh, they don't care who is Michael Schumacher in, in his job, in his racing car. Is it difficult to unwind between races now? We've got races every two weeks. Is that a major stress or is it a life you just live from beginning of the season to the end? Right. Well, I think it's a, it's a bit busy year, especially with all the testing we have in between. Because one week we have testing, one week we have racing. And especially overseas races, uh, you know, it's going to be a tight schedule. That's what we like to do and, you know, it's no real problem. But a summer break would be nice, actually. So how do you unwind after a race? Basically, I go home and uh, do what I enjoy doing. Uh, a lot of water sports and uh, whatever I'm, I like to do at that moment. And do you guys, two guys hang out a lot between races, if you get the opportunity, if you've both got three days that coincide? I mean, if we at the same spot, yes, we would do. But uh, he lives in Monaco, I do live in Switzerland. Um, so we have here and there the opportunity where we do so, but it's not like we spend all uh, every day uh, together. The thing is, traveling with two kids and five dogs is a bit difficult. <laughs> Tell us he about want to help me. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about the five dogs, Michael. Brazil is actually the home four of one dogs. of these dogs. Four. Yeah. Okay. It's four, four dogs. Yeah. It was always four. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> Tell us that story about the dog here in Brazil. Uh, it's not a big story, honestly. I mean, my wife fell in love with the dog from here, and and well, where the, was dog the dog fall in, the fall in, Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. on the racetrack. They wanted to throw it out, and actually, they they were quite bad to the dog. They were kicking it, and my wife she got quite upset, and she took care. I mean, she fed it, uh, and he fell in love uh, with her, and it was uh, the, the typical love story. I mean, he didn't didn't go away from her side anymore, and that was it. And now he's one of our dogs, and he lives happily in Switzerland. He does. Right now he's with my father, and uh, but uh, he's quite a happy dog. And what did you call him? He's called Flo. Flo is uh, like a flea, because <laughs> he has so many fleas on himself. Uh, when, we, when we met him here, obviously the first night we went to a veterinarian, we cleaned him, we, we gave all the vaccinations he had to have, and uh, that's why he was called Flea. 
So you two guys are hanging out, let's say, as an example. How difficult is it not to talk about the things that you know you're not supposed to talk about? It's very easy because we have to talk about it right now again, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> ten times a day usually. And as, as, as soon as we at home, we enjoy talking about other things, whatever we want to have for breakfast, for dinner, for lunch, whatever we want to do during the day. You know, it's uh, no problem at all. But you're way off in the woods together. Surely there's a moment where you want to ask him something about his car or vice versa. Does that not happen? Or do you have a, do you have a, a line between I mean, the two there, of them? There is naturally sometimes here and there we, we, we talk about what happens in the business uh, uh, sometimes. Yes, it, it does happen, but... I personally it, think that's surprisingly rare, basically. Yeah, actually it is. I mean, we, he is the godfather of uh, my, my uh, older daughter and he has to look after this sometimes, <laughs> which he could do more often, honestly. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, when, when we are together at home, there is loads of opportunities to do other things. I mean, we, we, we do sports, we go training, we go cycling, we play tennis, and uh, yeah, uh, recently we went yeah. <laughs> 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 like climbing. And, you know, we are we're very sport active, and mm -hmm. this moves us away from, from the business. So who's the fitter of the two? He. <laughs> no, I think, you know, we haven't measured us that out. I think we are fit enough for that, what we are doing, and that's the main important. It doesn't really matter who's the fitter one. And do you actually use the same training methods? Do you do the same amount of cardio, the same amount of muscle training? It varies a little bit. I mean, he has his personal trainer, I have a personal trainer. We both started actually this year with, with this. Um, Basically, the reason why we employed them is that they do our training and we can step back and relax. <laughs> <laughs> As we know with yours, very much so. But Michael, you've said in the past that, I think it was two years ago, you said you maybe weren't quite as fit as you were in the Benetton days, comparing it. I think you related it to getting married and you were spending a bit more time with the family. You said that last year anyway, perhaps I slightly. Would you, you look... I probably did less, uh, uh, less training, but more efficient, I'd say. Yes, this is probably true, but my numbers, except after the accident, have been always on a, in a certain range, which was always fit enough for, for what I had to do. This year, I'm pretty exceptionally fit, I have to say, because it's the first time I have this trainer with me, and I really do a lot, and I just made a test before I came here, and that uh, was very positive, so I'm... I'm obviously he's getting old now. Yeah, actually, I'm getting old and still getting better, so... <laughs> You're both getting older, to some extent. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. You've got a long way to go. <laughs> Sorry to ask this question, but I have to. Michael was hurt at Silverstone last year. What sort of emotions went through your mind when that happened? Well, actually, for the race, I heard that Michael went off and retired for the race and may have broken his leg. I didn't see the accident in s itself, so, um, you know, I mean, since then, Someone from Ferrari came to me, my team told me during the race what happened and that he was flown into the hospital. So, you know, straight after the race, obviously, which was a good result for us, but I, I just went into the hospital and then it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really nice to see that because, I mean, he was there lying there and, he, you know, nobody was able to help him, really, and that was, wasn't a very nice experience for me, really. Um, in that moment, you'd rather be there yourself. I mean, it's, it's very strange. And that was, that was quite a, an emotional moment for you, Michael, I think. Also, time you then spend at home, time you'd never normally spend at home, and um, you were quoted as saying a few things about a life that you don't normally see very much. I don't know if they were correct quotes or not, but uh, the support from your family and your wife and so forth. Was that, was that true? Was that a time when you were able to rethink a little bit about your priorities of life? And oh, for sure. I mean, you know, it's the 10th year I'm doing this, this kind of job. You get a certain routine, certain things develop in a certain direction, and you never get really a break to during the season to to may see certain things because there's never time enough for that mm. and change. And during that break, I saw uh, quite a couple of things which I thought, well, I can improve, I can change, I can be more relaxed, and, and all of uh, these things. And, uh, and what was it like watching Ralph on TV from back home? It's, it has been, I remember well being here the first year when we, when, when we came here, for him the first year. Uh, the circuit is a very bumpy circuit, very difficult circuit, and watching him uh, driving made me quite afraid, honestly, in the car, uh, because you see the car moving a lot, you see 
the car being on the edge and you know that if you go over the edge it's going to be possible to have a major accident. Uh, right now I, I get used to it honestly, I mean I know he obviously he does it well and, and you get confident in, in what he's doing and, and uh, you, you simply feel it's normal. One final question, you're both in equal cars, you're both fighting for position, would you race exactly the same way against your brother as you would against a Mika Hakkinen or a David Coulthard? Ralph? Well I think we wouldn't need to because we know each other very good and we would fight against each other. We did. We did in Magnico, for example. We did a couple of Celtic. Austria. Celtic, yeah, we did. Um, but Actually, he closed me the door. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he nearly crashed into my bag. But I think, you know, in a way, we shouldn't say that because motor racing and all that got so serious now. But I, I still enjoy doing that. And I think it's the same for him. But yeah. It's, it's I mean, you, you do race with with an open mind and, and you know who you who you work with you know you, you're not going to expect silly things bad things you simply fight and you you because that's what we enjoy i mean we want to fight we want to uh, uh, really have this situation and uh, we can deal with ourselves very serious on the limit but enjoying it really thank you very much both of you thank you